Thank you, Helen. Thank you. I suppose you can see me. I can't. I can just see myself, but <laughs> I can't even see myself here, but I can up there. Thank you so much. This is such a lovely opportunity. Yes, my, my story is pretty full on. There's a lot of bits and pieces to it. But I want to talk about an important time in my life, which is about now and, um, and about finding out a few things um, in my 74th year of life, coming to this point, I was, uh, I'll just go back. I was born in Athens, Greece in early 47. I was a child of Holocaust survivors. Um, they met in Auschwitz, my mother, a young Polish girl, and my father, a Greek man, 16 years older than her. Uh, he, his uh, role in the camp was a, as an elite prisoner he could get food, so that's how he tried to entice my mother. But I won't go into that. They eventually, as refugees, uh, they were taken on their death marches separately and met in Paris afterwards. Now, I was born out of that love. They lost everybody except for two uncles and my grandfather. Um, everyone else went through the gas chambers and um, they all died. So I was their first new life. And I believe, I always have, that I came down from the stars. I came down from my stars. I've known them since I was so little and I know exactly what they are, where they are, and I used to wave to them. And I even know that now. I found out only when I was 30 that they were called the Pleiades, but I did not know that at all. So I knew I was here on a mission. That, that was my, my beginning. So I've been an artist, I'm an artist, I'm a mother, all those things. But I decided for my 70th birthday that I needed to tell the story of my mum and dad. Um, my mother, she had written her story for us up until the time the Gestapo had got her. My father never really talked about it. We grew up with the numbers tattooed on their arms. It was just part of our lives. But they were true survivors and they had no hate in them. They gave us so much love and they embraced everybody. Our house was full of people. They spoke 13 languages between them. So we had people from all around the world in our lives and they embraced everybody because everyone was part of the family. So I thought I would want to get those stories together. I didn't know my dad's story. Um, about five years ago though, uh, some friends were visiting. They went back to Sydney, a Greek couple, and uh, they started looking up on the internet. The next thing I know, I got an email and a link. I clicked on the link and there were seven hours of interviews with my father in the Holocaust Museum in Washington in the United States, which we knew nothing about because he never talked about it. So I had my mum's story. The rest that we had taped was burnt in my, I've had two house fires. It was burnt in my house fire. So it's in the book. So. I, I got my dad's story and I started, I went over to Margaret River, Western Australia. I went into a residency. I'd never written before. I'm a visual artist and a storyteller orally. And um, I started uh, translating and transcribing my dad's um, story. And then with my mum's, and then I put my story with it to make this book, which is called Don't Cry Dance. And it's ridiculous, but I haven't even got one here. It's in my bedroom and I can't get up now. So I will show it to you later. What a ridiculous thing. Fancy not having it here. But what I wanted to talk about was, I, the book took me three and a half years to do. And I went in such dark places, going into the camps over and over again and reading what they'd been through, what the things that those people had been through. And I just wrote it. I was just part of it. I didn't realize what it was doing to me. I had no idea. After three and a half years, I self-published the book for the reason that I needed to keep their, their voices authentic. It's in the first person. My mum's talking with her accent. My dad's talking with his accent and I'm talking with my accent. So it's in the first person. I couldn't give this to some strange publishing house which would take over and maybe change the way my parents were talking. So I took it on myself. I didn't have any money, but I didn't realize what was in store and some friends helped me publish the book. 
just as I launched the book a year ago, it would have been in September, was the first launch in the Jewish Museum in Sydney. I had to make sure that the professor of Holocaust studies in the Jewish Museum, that it was all correct and right. Because in the schools, they're, they're studying um, Holocaust studies. It's part of history. And having it in that first person was important. So I decided, you know, that, that I really wanted it to be, as they said. So I had the launch at the Jewish Museum, and then I had the second launch up here where I live on the Central Coast. So many people came, but I must say, I was starting to lose a lot of weight and I was starting to be very unwell. I thought I was grieving because I was always such a healthy person. And I thought I was grieving because I never did a lot of grief in such a way. I didn't realize until my kids said, look, you better go and check this out. And I was shaking and I wasn't well. And I found out that I had stage four lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it was right through my body, all the way through, up my spine, through my pelvic area, up into my shoulders. And I went down. Like I had to do everything I could to, um, to heal. But before that, in July, I went to Fiji. Fiji has been like my second home for about 30 something years. I worked over there with the people. I was artist in residence in Fiji. And I had a village on an island that took me in way back 35 years ago. And I kept going back. And I went there to read the last proofread of my, my story. And I read it aloud to myself. The printer had already printed that one copy for me to check. And I was sitting in my little bourree and I was reading it aloud to myself. And this particular day, I said to my relatives in spirit, I said, I'm giving you back your name. You may have died as a number, but your name's back and you're in the book and I honor you and you could go, go with the light. I, I understand the horrors that you went with. And I said this to them, and then I lay down. And when I lay down, where is it? Good heavens. Just trying to find. Oh, here it is in front of me. When I lay down, I saw all these people coming out of the dark towards me, all my ancestors. And I could see them. And I got up, and because I document my life in art, I got up. I'm working on black paper and I did this artwork and I called this Ancestors. Can, I hope you can see that. Mm -hmm. That's my Ancestors. So I put that aside. I didn't know then the next stage where it was going to go. So when I found out I had the lymphoma, I knew I had to have a whole lot of sessions of chemo. I didn't want to. I was on the medicinal cannabis. I've always had a clear life and I decided I was going to continue on that. And I told my doctor and the specialist that I was going to do that. But they told me I had to still do it because it was really bad. And if I needed, if I had wanted to get it, I had to go with the chemo. So I decided while I was having chemo that I would do an artwork just when I was having chemo. And because it was in my blood, I had all the rogue blood cells in me and they were like munching away like little Pac-Men. And I, I thought, I'm going to do this artwork, which I did. And it finished when I finished my chemo. And I called this one Bloodlines. Can you see that? And yeah. so what I did by doing this, I was smashing the bad cells and I was bringing in regenerating the good cells. And so that was the second part, part of it. Then I came through it. I came through it and I thought, right, I've got to do another artwork to finish this up. I came through it because I lay there, I trusted and I surrendered. A friend of mine said she'd been looking after a friend with cancer who died. And she said to me, she fought to the end and I thought, I never fought once. I surrendered. I did everything in my power, but by fighting, you see, this is what I was saying before, to Rick, I, we need to change the language. 
by fighting, you either win or you lose. You challenge your body. You stress your body because you're fighting. I don't like that. So I surrendered to it. And I decided then I would, I got the first scan that I had that showed all the cancer in me. And then the last scan that I had where it was all gone. And I called this one transformation. And it's right there. Can you see that? So you can see all the cancer, all the white in my body there is all the lymphoma. And then this one, it's gone. And it's strange, but behind my spine, a little face was looking out. So I used a bit of artistic license. It was like a little angel was looking out of my clean, clear body. And I knew that I had more work to do. Ironically though, because I was going through all my artwork because I document life all the time in, in my art. And ironically in 2018, when I was in Margaret River doing the book, I did this artwork in between. And I called this Nina, the duality dilemma. Now I had a whole mop of red curly hair to such a point that people would always recognize me by my hair or if somebody said, where's Nina? They'd say, oh, she's taking her hair for a walk or something like that. Everyone saw me through my hair. And I said, there were two constants in my life, my hair and my coffee in the morning. Well, when I got the lymphoma, I went off coffee and my hair fell out. So that was a big lesson. But then I found this that I had done. And this I called Nina the Duality Dilemma in 2018. How was I to know that that is what is happened, what's happened to me now? So it just shows the magic when we just, you know, give away. I I know, you know, I don't know how much time I have because I put my clock on and then I lost my clock. I don't even know. Um, and oh, I forgot to start it. Would you Did please? anyone time? Did anyone time, Nina? Am I on? I think uh, there's about two more minutes, Nina. Okay, I can finish this off in two minutes. Um, I just wanted to say that I realised in all the time I was lying there, where did this come from? Where did this cancer come from? The bloodlines connects me to my ancestors that it happened to be in my blood, which connects me to all my lost ancestors. And then I realized that it came through this intergenerational trauma, which a lot of Holocaust families go through, just like our indigenous people here in Australia and probably in other countries as well. And that I found that when a girl baby is born, she's got every egg in her ovaries that she's going to need. And every egg is a cell and every cell has a memory. And I was one of those cells which took on the memory because I, I was in utero in my mum when, when she was going through all her trauma with my dad and all her crying and all her grief and all her losses in Athens in Greece. And um, I realised then how important it is when we can address where our pain comes from. If we can address it early, then it won't manifest into an illness. When we understand it, we can start healing. And that is my, that is what I, I'm passionate about. I, that's why I'm back here. Starts with my mum and dad's survival, ends with mine. But that's why I'm still here because this is what I must address and um, do these women's storytelling circles, which I've started, which addresses these issues. So I'll leave that part of my story for now. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>